Our next speaker is Dr. Ranit Aronov, who is uh, the Chief Technology Officer and uh, AI researcher in uh, Pangea Biomed. And this is uh, my journey with decision making. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I am the daughter of uh, Yakir, and I actually have better proof than you because I have a picture <laughs> where we are together, uh, just a little bit younger than today. So this is me and uh, Yakir. And even though I am the daughter of the uh, birthday guy, I got the worst slot of the session, which is the last one, but I'll try to keep you awake. Um, so I'm not a physicist. Let's start by that, so that's a big difference. Um, my field is artificial intelligence, or AI, uh, which is essentially uh, trying to build computer programs that can learn from a lot of data and experience how to solve new problems, how to cope with new situations. Um, and I was preparing this talk, um, thinking back to AI and what I do. And even though AI is very, very broad, and the things that I do in AI are broad, so if I look back in the last 20 years or so, or so, I've applied AI to mainly two what could be seemingly very unrelated domains. So first is developing computer programs that can understand and analyze and converse and even generate uh, human language. And the other is um, developing AI programs that can help diagnose and treat cancer. So supposedly these are very different, and AI is very broad. Um, it affects all facets of our daily life, as I'm sure you all feel um, every day, um, all the time. But looking back at those, um, uh, everything I've done uh, in the last uh, 20 years, I realized that I chose topics that have to do with how AI can help people make better decisions. And then a memory uh, came up. I don't know if you remember that, and I kept that as a surprise, so I'll ask you later. Um, I was about this age, so this is Yakir, this is uh, my brother Eyal and myself. I was, I think, nine. It wasn't there, it was at home, I remember that. And Yakir comes up to me and says, so Ranit, um, how do you make decisions? Okay, I'm, I'm nine years old, I don't get the question uh, quite uh, completely, so he makes it more concrete, and he says, imagine you're in a cafeteria, and you have to choose a dessert plate. One of them has a chocolate cake, one of them has cheesecake. By the way, I didn't like neither at that age, but I'm not sure he knew that. And he said, so you decide to go for the chocolate cake, and you extend your arm um, to the plate, and at that moment, when you make that decision, do you feel you have free will? Or are your atoms in the brain and your hand making you uh, make that choice. Um, I don't remember what I answered, and I kind of think that my answer did not have a profound effect on uh, the future of physics, but maybe this conversation about free will and decision making um, did affect my decision to somehow um, deal with things that revolve around um, how we make decisions and how we can make uh, better decisions. And I think we know that we don't always uh, make better decisions. And if I have a minute at the end, I'll explain why this little thing is here. So I'm going to tell you about two projects, one of each of those uh, domains. So the first one is many, many years um, after that. Um, I worked at IBM Research, and I managed a large team that developed what is called Project Debater. So IBM Research has a really nice tradition of grand challenges. And in general, artificial intelligence has gone hand in hand with teaching computers to play games. This has been, um, I'm sure most of you have heard about uh, Deep Blue in 1997 defeating uh, Kasparov. Um, in 2011, a uh, computer, again by IBM, uh, won the Jeopardy uh, TV show against the two uh, all-time uh, champions. Um, and there were other, AlphaGo, if uh, you heard of DeepMind. Um, and in 2011, there was a call for proposals um, from all researchers at IBM Research. Um, asking for ideas. What could be the next grand challenge? What would, could be the next interesting computer to develop? And uh, Noam Slonim, who I knew from my PhD and later became my colleague in this uh, uh, venture, um, offered, suggested, why don't we develop a computer that would hold a live competitive debate in natural language with a human being? And this sounded a bit crazy, but all grand challenges, when people start thinking about them, sound crazy. Otherwise, they won't be grand challenges, and they would not be that interesting. Um, and eight years later, on the stage in San Francisco, there was a live debate between a computer and um, a guy called Harish Natarajan, who's like the Kasparov of the uh, debate world. 
And I'm gonna show you uh, three minutes of this debate. Um, so in very short, what we're going to see, the debate was about, it's called a motion, what you're debating about. We should subsidize preschool. Um, this was chosen from a set of topics that was never shown to the computer before the debate. So this is important to understand when you think about AI. When you go to um, learn how to debate, you don't learn specific debate. The idea is not to learn how to debate specific topics. The idea is to learn how to debate a new topic. This is what artificial intelligence is all about. Um, so this is a new topic. The computer has never uh, seen it before. Harish has never seen it before. Um, and each side had 15 minutes to prepare. That's it, okay? Um, the format, we chose a rather simple format. Each side has four minutes. Project debater is for the motion. It's called the government. Harish is the opposition. You have four minutes for opening speeches, four minutes for second speeches, which include a rebuttal, so you sort of have to answer your opponent, and two minute summary speech, and everything is fully automatic. So <coughs> let's hope this works technology-wise. Yes. <laughs> I think we need- Greetings, more. Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against humans, but I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. <laughs> when we subsidize preschools and the like, we are making good use of government money because they carry benefits for society as a whole. For decades, research has demonstrated that high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for this historic event. And it certainly was a pleasure to listen to Project Debater. There was a lot of information in that speech and lots of facts and lots of figures. The problem, though, is the reality of subsidizing preschools is one which does not deal with the underlying problems in society. If you massively increase the number of people going to preschool, they are all going to be the ones going to the high-quality preschools. In a competitive environment at the age of three or four, when you're learning that, you are, you're, that that other child is potentially better than you, when you realize you aren't necessarily as talented as someone else, that huge psychological damage for many children may not even may mean that preschool is actively harmful. Among other things, I think Mr. Natarajan suggested that preschools should not be subsidized because this will reduce their quality. I would like to offer a different view. I disagree with my opponent. Subsidizing preschools will have no negative effect on their quality. If anything, the opposite is true. One of many reasons is that subsidizing attracts more skilled and qualified people to the field, improving the quality of preschools for all. My opponent claimed that preschools are harmful. I believe my argument suggested that the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages. I touched upon three issues, children, students, and crime. Specifically, I noted that preschool education improves children's development. In addition, I suggested that attending preschool helps students succeed. And a final point to consider is that preschool can prevent future crime. We should subsidize preschools. Thanks for your attention. Okay, so the clear um, question is how does this work? Um, this is a simple answer. Um, and when you have such a grand challenge, one path forward is to dissect this huge problem into smaller, more amenable um, things that we can tackle and understand and develop. And really every box here is uh, many people working for a long time, publishing a lot of papers and um, diligently trying to improve every one of these boxes. So um, I'll spend two minutes um, explaining this diagram. If you lose me here, don't worry about that. We'll I'll come back to fun stuff later. Um, so this is the motion. And really, the first thing that Project Debater does is gets arguments, right? They get arguments in order to build its speeches. And there are two main sources for these arguments. One is argument mining. So 
we have in the memory of Project Debater uh, 400 million articles from newspapers over many, many years, um, and as well as scientific journals. And all of these are indexed, they've gone through pre-processing, never mind those details. Now Project Debater looks for pieces of text that first relate to the topic, because we don't know what the topic is in advance, so it's articles about basically every topic appearing in newspapers and, and scientific journals. Um, and looking not just the sentences that are related to the topic, but that are argumentative, because you're debating something. You don't just want to say something about you know, how many preschools are there in the United States. You want to have something about the OECD saying something good about preschools. Um, and Project Debater has to understand, is it an argument for subsidizing preschools or against subsidizing preschools? And getting this wrong could be really bad. Um, so it puts all the four on its side in order to prepare the speech. It, but it also identifies claims against subsidizing preschools or preschools in general, because when it will have to rebut the other side, it prepares in advance claims that the other side might say and then matches evidence like the OECD that you heard that answer that claim. So it also prepares um, things that it will try to catch the other side saying and then have a response for them. The other source of arguments is something that debaters do all the time, and it took us time to realize that. There are fundamental, principal arguments. We all do that when we debate and we discuss topics. Things that um, relate in general to a lot of topics. So a simple example, if you're talking about banning alcohol, or you're talking about banning gambling, people will bring up the argument of a black market emerging, and that's bad, or you can, you, know, you can deal with that, and so on and so forth. And this is very general. So in a lot of different debates, there's a question of where is the limit of the government interfering with our individual lives? Is it the right time to do that or not? And this comes along in many cases, and what we did is we built sort of a, a graph of human dilemmas um, and responses, arguments and responses to those arguments, et cetera. And what Project Debater has to do is understand whether the motion, which category of these arguments it belongs to. And you can get it wrong. Even the simple example of banning is okay to talk about the black market when you talk about gambling, but it's kind of ridiculous if the motion is banning breastfeeding in public, which is um, not a very good idea to talk about a black market there. By the way, you heard some humor there. This is also here. So the humor, the jokes are pre-prepared, just like I, I, I never invent jokes, but I know when to use them. So Project Debater did have to know the right point to use something about poverty, right? So this is sort of something in the middle. Um, and then it has to organize all these arguments into speeches. There's, you know, there's a time, and you don't just give a list of arguments. So you have to remove redundancies. You have to organize these um, arguments into themes. You have to understand what this theme is and say, now I'm going to talk about poverty, or now I'm going to talk about crime. Um, and of course, then you have to generate the speech. The speech is not known in advance, so you have to have a component that could actually read out and have a debate. And of course, there's this rebuttal part, which I said before. So these two cases also have Project Debater prepared with an, you know, an army of claims and evidence that are pre-prepared and listening to the opponent, it captures those and uh, makes a rebuttal. Um, now, oh, this is an old one, sorry. It's not the latest presentation, but never mind. Um, so there are a lot of boxes there, um, and many things need to succeed, right? Because if you get, if you get one of them wrong, one error, um, the whole thing uh, crashes. Um, I want to give you one example, um, just so um, uh, you get the feel of this. Oh, this is really an old presentation. I'm sorry about that. OK, so let's go here. So um, using these topic tags, right? So if I'm talking about, for example, banning gambling, then I might want to say that people enjoy gambling, and therefore we should attempt to fix it rather than eliminate it. But if I now have a debate about assisted suicide, and I try to use the same trick of people enjoy assisted suicide, therefore we should attempt to fix it rather than eliminate it, this would not work very well. Um, there was also a little box there I didn't talk about, but oftentimes you have a debate about something, but you can bring arguments about something else. So if you have a debate, for example, about social media, it makes sense to bring arguments about Facebook or about TikTok and vice versa. Or if you have a debate about eliminating the multi-party system, just an idea, then you might want to say, I have an alternative to the multi-party system. This is the two-party system, and you talk about why this is good. Um, here's an example. If we're talking about surrogacy, 
let me discuss a welcome alternative to surrogacy. This is adoption, and if we stay with the uh, um, assisted suicide idea, this is all real examples. Um, let me discuss an alternative to suicide, which has some advantages. This is homicide, not a good idea. So really, a lot of things do go wrong, can go wrong, but after many years, we, we were able to eliminate most of those. So that took eight years to get to this point, and then two full years to publish this paper. Um, we eventually did manage to, and one of the big problems in publishing this work is evaluation. So it's nice to have a demonstration, you have one debate, but you know, if you want it to be in a scientific journal, you have to have some evaluation. But how do you evaluate a system that debates? And this is a real difference between this and the games that computers played before. There is no clear winner. If you ask who won, you have to have an audience. You have to have somebody listening to the debate actively. And what we did is we saw which side convinced more people to switch their opinion from before to after the debate, and Harish won. Uh, but when we asked people which side they learned more from, by far people learned more from Project Debater, which I'll get to in a minute about decision making. Um, so we had to find some really cunning ways to evaluate the system automatically and compare it to existing um, systems. At that time, GPT-2, for those who know GPT, was like the best system. If you just look at the first speech, uh, Project Debater is uh, by far better than all the um, automatic systems out there. I won't go into more details about that. But I want to come back to uh, decision making. So I think that AI, at least today in its form, should not make decisions. This is not the point of Project Debater. Project Debater is not deciding which side to take and not deciding eventually uh, which side is more correct. But if we think about the amount of data we have out there, we are drowning in data. So if you have AI that can somehow s go through all that data, and organize it in a way that is digestible by humans, then you can get, make decisions, better decisions, because you can see really both sides of the matter. And there's another angle to this, which we developed later, which is called speech by crowd, which is taking arguments from people, whether they are customers, employees, or citizens, um, and actually taking all of those natural language inputs that people put in surveys and bringing that to decision makers so they can actually understand what it is that people think, those people that the decisions they're making are going to affect. This picture is, by the way, from Speech by Crowd in the Cambridge Debate Club, which is the oldest debate club in the world. A project debater gave an opening speech there based on arguments made by uh, people in the audience in, in Cambridge. So I'm going to fast forward in the last uh, few minutes to talk about where I am today, which is uh, Pangea Biomed or Pangea Biomed, um, and uh, this has to do with cancer and precision oncology. I've been in that area before and I came uh, back to it. It's really uh, a passion of mine to, um, to help solve these issues. And I think you all know that um, there are new treatments for cancer. In some cases, they work uh, miracles. Um, and this is called precision medicine. These therapies uh, emerge from really new understanding about the genetics of, of tumors. And by understanding more about the genetics of tumors, people were able to target using um, uh, different new drugs, these aberrations of the genetic code. But the problem is, the reality is that in order to match patients to those treatments, people search for these exact aberrations in the genome. So people look for the, whether the target, I'll take a few more minutes, whether the target is uh, problematic in that tumor. And what we do in Pangea, and this is uh, based on uh, more than a decade of, of uh, academic research, is instead of looking at this gene that is targeted by the drug, we look at the context. We look at many genes in the tumor and ask, is the situation of those genes, those that are overregulated, underregulated, is in the tumor of a specific patient, are these such that they will help the drug um, be effective or are they such, that their state is such that resistance is likely to occur, which is a big problem in cancer uh, therapy. And these changes in expression and activation and regulation of genes are by far more common than these rare cases of matching um, based on these genetic, specific genetic problems that people have developed uh, medications uh, for. Um, so we have... Uh, developed a whole uh, machine here, which I won't go into, but it's 
very important to understand that when people talk about finding what are called biomarkers using AI, what they usually do is they take a lot of people who received, say, a certain medication or treatment or whatever. Some of them respond, some do not respond, and then they compare, right? So they have the gene expression of those that responded, those that did not respond, and they look for differences and say, hey, is there a marker? But that kind of data is extremely scarce in medicine. To know what happened with people, if they responded or not, follow up is something that's very difficult to obtain. So this path is sort of hits a wall very often. So we avoided that by really dissecting the problem into two phases. In one, we understand these interactions between genes just based on very readily available cancer data. And then we do what I said before. We look at a specific uh, patient. We look at the drug. There are many dozens of drugs that target specific genes. And we can give a score for each of them. And we validate this very broadly on hundreds of, of patients in clinical trials. What we basically show is that if you use this method called Enlight, you can identify which patients are going to respond to treatments that are given to them in the clinic. So patients who received drugs that Enlight thought are the right drug for them had markedly better uh, chances to respond than those patients who received drugs that Enlight thought is not the right choice for them. So this is validated. This also has an effect on how you design clinical trials, which I won't go into. We've done a lot of comparisons to um, existing biomarkers, and Enlight has so far proven to be better than those. Um, but uh, I want to end by going back to decision making, um, this time for uh, doctors and patients. So here's a true story. By the way, um, what we do is now offered uh, for patients in pro bono, pro bono fashion, so we do that for free. It's still in the clinical uh, research phases. Uh, but this is a true story. This is a young woman, 35 years old. Um, she uh, was diagnosed with a rare form of liver cancer. Um, she metastasized, the disease progressed. She went to one of those tests that are offered today, looking for those genetic aberrations that might say, hey, this treatment, this new treatment works for you. And she got an empty report. This is the case in 90% of the cases, it returns empty, unfortunately. Um, she had metastatic sites all over. And then she reads Ranan Berger uh, from Tel Shomer, who works in the scientific advisory board of our company. He says, you have to try. And we tried. This was back in June of 2020. I wasn't with the company yet. Um, and she started on a treatment recommended by Enlight, which was contrary to the biomarkers that she had. So she started on immunotherapy, but all her markers, standard markers for immunotherapy, were actually negative. Um, and she responded. She responded in five months. Um, this is actually not updated. Uh, we know uh, that she's still um, leading a normal life today, um, really uh, two years later. So th this is what makes it all worth it. Um, and uh, I want to finish by thanking all the people uh, that I work with in my new version. I also have another picture here, but it's gone. So this is my, uh, my colleagues in uh, Pangea. Uh, this is the awesome team uh, in IBM that uh, uh, we developed Project Debater. And I think the most important decisions that I make in life are not what I work on, but who I work with. Um, so I'm always really um, very careful about uh, choosing uh, the teams I work with, and I'm enjoying that a lot. Um, so I'm going to take another minute because I put this uh, uh, picture here of this book. Um, so one memory as I was going through pictures and, and thinking about how my work relates um, to, to my dad is I remember when I was somewhere between that, these two pictures, I think probably five years old, I really enjoyed, dad used to read uh, from Three Men in a Boat, which is really the Bible I grew up on. Um, and if you haven't read it, that's the time, never too late. Um, so he would read that book and really laugh out, you know, roll out in this uh, laughter. And I would sit there and just, you know, get laughing because he laughed. I had no idea what he's laughing about. I don't think I could understand anything from the book, but just the sheer joy of laughing. Um, so happy birthday and many more years of science and laughter. <laughs>